um, and it, all sorts of stuff. So, um, good evening, and I'll, I'll try to make my comments very brief. Mm -hmm. Please, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Kathy schlein Files, and I am the director of the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute at the University of Connecticut, go team. Yay, AAASI. Um, and on behalf of the Institute, it is my honor to welcome you to this year's AHIMSA Symposium titled uh, Indian Nationalism and Global Fascism. And I apologize for the typo that appeared on the flyer that um, is absolutely my fault. I apologize. What did it say? India. As well as Indian. Indian nationalism, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> so, but I didn't want you to see it India, afterwards. India, Indian? Yeah, that's the same. Yeah. Um, made possible through the generous support of our community partners in the Jane Center of Greater Hartford, this annual uh, lecture consistently pushes us to rethink, re envision, and reimagine spaces uh, for India and Indian studies. And I'm thankfully joined by my cohort and my colleague in crime. Uh, Professor Betty Hansen, who's the director of the India Studies Program, who has also helped co-sponsor this event. Um, and I want to personally thank Dr. Fakir Jain and the Jain Center of Greater Hartford for their continued support and their expansive vision. So I know that our speaker may not need much of an introduction, but I'm going to do so anyway. Uh, Vijay Prashad is an Indian historian and journalist. He is also a professor of international studies at Trinity College where he currently holds the George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian History. Professor Prashad is the author of 15 books, two of them picked by the Village Voices Books of the Year, as well as nine edited volumes. These books include The Death of the Nation and the Future of the Arab Revolution, No Free Left, The Futures of Indian Communism, The Poor Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, Uncle Swami, Being South Asian in America, Arab Spring, Libyan Winter, the Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting, Afro-Asian Connections in the Myth of Cultural Purity, Karma of Brown Folk, and Untouchable Freedom, The Scholar History of a Dalit Community. His edited works are likewise capacious. These include Land of Blue Helmets, The United Nations in the Arab World, Communist Histories, Volume 1, Letters to Palestine, Writers Respond to War and Occupation, Dispatches from the Arab Revolt, Dispatches from Pakistan, and dispatches from Latin America. While Professor Prashad's oeuvre is incontrovertibly <laughs> impressive, I want to close with a more personal note. In fact, I've never shared this uh, with uh, Professor Prashad, but I remember we met at a stop and shop in Northampton. Um, and I was with my friend Anita Manor, and he gave the best piece of advice to anybody pursuing an academic career, which is just publish your first tenure book and then do whatever you want after that. And I think that you know, that will come through. Um, it is all too rare that we encounter actual human beings. Please come in. Um, it is all too rare that we encounter actual human beings in our field. Such individuals are aspirational in their tireless activism, which more often than not extends from the page into the real world stage. It is therefore an absolute privilege to welcome Professor Prashad back to UConn. So thank you. Thanks. So, uh, let me applaud. First, thanks a lot, Kathy. Thanks for keeping, you know, you keep inviting me to come to UConn. It's great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to read this text out for you. I'm writing a, uh, you see, I got, in, maybe this will become clear, but I got interested in this subject because it appeared, uh, at least in India, that we were slipping into some sort of fascistic uh, dispensation in the last period. And I was interested in this emergence, perhaps, of Indian foreign policy in the 1930s. Uh, around solidarity with other movements. And uh, I think it will become clear why I'm interested in this project. But this project is really about the formation of Indian foreign policy in the anti-colonial struggle. You know, we think of foreign policy as something that happens after a, you know you won independence and you set up the Ministry of External Affairs and so on. But this is maybe where the foreign policy begins. And you know, given that India's foreign policy now is so different than this story, you know, these lineages, 
I wanted to return to this origin of Indian foreign policy and see where it gets us. So, you know, you come with me for a little journey. So, let's go. <laughs> In 1950, M.S. Azar, one of the clearest voices of the 20th century, looked back at the long history of colonialism that was coming to an end. He wanted to judge colonialism from the ashes of Nazism, an ideology that surprised the innocent in Europe, but which had been fostered slowly in Europe's colonial experience. After all, the instruments of Nazism, racial super superiority, as well as brutal genocidal violence had been cultivated in the colonial worlds of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Cesar, the effervescent poet and communist, had no problem with the encounter between cultures. The entanglement of Europe's culture with that of Africa and Asia had forged the best of human history across the Mediterranean Sea. But colonialism was not cultural contact. It was brutality. And this is what Cesar wrote. Between colonization and civilization, there is an infinite distance. That out of all the colonial expeditions that have been undertaken, out of all the colonial statues that have been drawn up, out of all the memoranda that have been dispatched by all the ministries, there could not come a single human value. It's important to read this now when we're in the middle of a debate again whether colonialism should return or to adjudge it, you know. Cesar was adamant. Colonialism had produced nothing that would earn it respect in the scales of history. This was in 1950, when a few nations had just emerged out of the scar of colonialism and when many societies fought pitched battles to extricate themselves, to remove themselves from colonial power. What had come to define fascism inside Europe through the experience of the Nazis, the jackboots and the gas chambers were familiar already in the colony. This colonial fascism, Cesar argued in discourse on colonialism, needed to be emphasized. Colonialism was asserting itself in this period, pushing to revive its empires from Vietnam to Algeria, from Kenya to Malaya. It pretended to distinguish itself from fascism then considered essentially evil, and to resurrect itself in a paternalist and benign form. Cesar would have nothing to do with that. Colonialism and fascism shared too much at the level of effects, in terms of how they appeared to their victims. It was clear to Cesar, as a Marxist, that fascism was a political form of bourgeois rule in times when democracy threatened capitalism. Colonialism, on the other hand, was naked power, justified by racism to seize resources from people who were not willing to hand them over. Their form was different, but their manners were identical. Colonialism was defeated by the brave mass struggle that ran from British India to the colony of the Gold Coast, from the Spanish protectorate of Morocco to French Indochina. Here, men and women risked a great deal to come out onto the streets and refused to cower before the military might of an unjust formation. The struggles were complex, using strategies and tactics that differed even within one context, running the gamut from armed insurrection to non-violent, non-cooperation. Yet something linked these struggles, the sensibility that freedom was more important than subjugation, that the poverty that faced the peoples of Africa and Asia, as well as Latin America, came not from their own backwardness, but from the system of colonial rule, and that they were people capable of making their own history, driven by their own dreams and their own projects. The sense of a combined struggle manifest itself in Brussels in the winter of 1927 at the League Against Imperialism meeting. Delegates came from colonies as far afield as Puerto Rico and Indonesia. The delegates, many influenced by Marxism, the experience of the USSR, and of their own deepened struggle against imperialism, no longer had merely a sentiment of resentment against foreign rule. They now developed a theory of imperialism that drew from earlier accounts of theft of their wealth to enrich Europe 
and of the subjugation of their people into a captive market for European goods. At the Brussels meeting, Jawaharlal Nehru, a leader of the Indian movement, said, it does not require statistics, facts, or figures to convince you that India, in the course of the last few generations, had terribly deteriorated and is in such a bad way that if something drastic is not done to stop this process, India may even cease to exist as a nation. These were not idle words. Famine had racked India in the Victorian era, killing perhaps 10 million people, if not more. This was the spur of the nationalist movement and is often not acknowledged to be such. There is a literature on the famine and then there's a literature on the national movement. But the national movement was, I think, pushed along by this massive epidemic of series of famines and the callousness of British rule in a reaction to the famines. By 1927, the national movement, led into the masses by Gandhi and the left, had developed a new energy in the country. But in the absence of something drastic, namely independence and a social revolution, India might not survive. This was a general sense within nationalist circles in the 1920s. But Britain was not eager to let go. Naturally, therefore, from their capitalist and imperialist point of view, Nehru said, Nehru is going to appear a lot in this talk because he is a central character in the construction of 1930s foreign policy. Naturally, therefore, imagine a world leader speaking like this today. Naturally, therefore, from their capitalist and imperialist point of view, Nehru said, they wanted to do everything in their power to hold on to India. Imperialism was not eager to let its colonies go. It used the most hideous violence to hold on. Violence such as the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar on April 13, 1919, when a thousand unarmed men, women, and children were killed by British-led troops. By 1927, the disparate anti-colonial movements had developed a common approach toward imperialism and toward each other. It was understood that their nationalism was born out of their anti-colonial struggles and was not rooted in the European theory of nationalism, namely around ideas of a common language, a common culture, and, as they believe, a common race. Such a nationalism, this European variety, tended toward racism, fascism, and imperialism, all three seen as objectionable by the anti-colonial nationalists. That is why their nationalism's lineage was not European, but was forged largely out of their experiences. It was an anti-colonial nationalism, an international nationalism. No wonder, therefore, there was no reverse racism in this movement, which was content with slogans such as the covenant of white and brown will make humanity free, and was content to work with European radicals to drive Europe itself from barbarity to colonialism. It took years for the experience of the League Against Imperialism and the Communist International, as well as exposure of one movement to another to germinate into concrete positions and plans. In 1935, <coughs> Italy, eager for a slice of Africa, began to beat the war drums against Abyssinia, or Ethiopia. Italian fascism claimed that it would bring civilization to Abyssinia, which was painted as a country of slavery. Italy was not alone here. Britain's foreign secretary, Sir John Simon, refused to allow Ethiopia to invoke Article 15 of the League of Nations Covenant in January 1935, when pressure toward war began. That article, Article 15, would have allowed the League of Nations to study the conflict between Italy and Ethiopia, and on that basis, give a judgment. In April, both Britain and France gave Mussolini, who was flying the plane, in April, both Britain and France gave Mussolini the green light for this invasion. Neither would they shut the Suez Canal to his ships, nor would they deny Italy fuel. Britain sold arms to Italy, but enforced an arms embargo against Ethiopia. Italian aircraft 
which used chemical weapons on the Ethiopians, were flying from Royal Air Force bases in British Somaliland. It was clear that this was naked colonialism, with the old colonial powers in cahoots with the fascist powers. On June 30th, 1936, Ethiopia's Emperor Haile Selassie went before the very deaf League of Nations. He said that the Italians had used their weaponry not only against his soldiers, but mainly against civilians. The Italians fired mustard gas, the never-ending reign of death, as Haile Selassie called it. With the intention, and this is Haile Selassie, with the intention of destroying all living things, with the intention of thereby ensuring the destruction of waterways and pastures, the Italian commanders had their airplanes circle ceaselessly back and forth. This was their foremost method of warfare. This horrifying tactic was successful. Humans and animals were destroyed. All those touched by the rain of death fled, screaming in pain. All those who drank the poisoned water and ate the contaminated food succumbed to unbearable torture. Such descriptions would not have startled the Indian listener. The Royal Air Force had bombed Burma in 1932 and then bombed the northeast of India with exceptional ferocity. Colonel Arthur Osborne of the Indian Medical Service said of an experience he had in 1935, when our troops entered a bombed village, the pariah dogs are already at work, eating the corpses of the babies and old women who had been killed. Many suffer from ghastly wounds, especially some of the younger children who are all covered with flies and crying for water. It was clear to Indian nationalists that the Italian aggression was of course an early example of European fascism, but it was also plainly in line with colonial brutality. The Bombay Chronicle, where this uh, cartoon appeared in 1936, the Bombay Chronicle, which was a nationalist paper published in Bombay, in mid-August of 1935, attacked the idea of fascist paternalism. What moral compass was there, wrote the editor, for the idea that people of white nationalities must feel justified to attack and destroy the national rights and liberties of colored and oriental peoples. The editor of the Bombay Chronicle wrote plaintively that India could not do anything by way of substantial help to Abyssinia. The Congress Socialist Party organized a Solidarity Day on September 1st, 1935, and the next year in Calcutta, the association against the Italo-Abyssinian War was set up. The next year, under pressure from these initiatives and from the Congress's own drift leftward, the Working Committee of the Congress took a strong stand against the war. Abhorrence of the brutal massacre of peaceful <coughs> masses of Ethiopians was at the forefront. These were victims of fascist aggression, which had to be defeated. Not just the fascism of Italy, but also of the British. Solidarity with the African brethren in distress, as the Congress put it, led to Indian National Congress meetings to condemn the war across British India in May 1936. The Indian Red Cross Society sent money and medical supplies to the Abyssinian Red Cross. But as a colony, the Indians felt paralyzed unable to do more than denounce European aggression and send modest amount of aid to the Ethiopians. In 1936, peasants and workers revolted in Palestine against British rule, the sale of land to Jewish settlers, and the Zuama of Palestine, the big landowners and elites. It was a major uprising that lasted for over three years before being crushed by the British. Palestinians looked to India for inspiration. As one poet wrote, if only one of our leaders would fast like Gandhi. You know, I can't tell you how many times people outside India say this. If only somebody would go on a fast like Gandhi. But this is the best line I've ever found in the archives. If only one of our leaders would fast like Gandhi, perhaps his fast would do some good. There is no need for him to abstain from food. In Palestine, a leader would die without food. <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> Let him abstain from selling land and keep a plot in which to lay his bones. During the revolt in Palestine, the Indian National Congress carefully studied the events in West Asia. Sympathy with the Arabs was instinctive, since the Arabs were under British colonial rule, and they were being forced to surrender their land to Jewish settlers. 
On October 31st, 1937, the Indian National Congress took a firm position against the reign of terror by British imperialists and Jewish terrorists, such as the Haganah, and offered the solidarity of Indians to the Palestinians in their struggle for national freedom. It's a very clear statement. The calculation for this position was made the next year by Gandhi. Gandhi was actually a very important figure in coming up with this position on Palestine. My sympathies are with the Jews, he wrote on November 26, 1938. But my sympathy does not bind me to the requirements of judgment, justice. My sympathy does not bind me to the requirements of justice. For Gandhi, Palestine belongs to the Arabs. And surely it would be a crime against humanity to reduce the proud Arabs so that Palestine can be restored to the Jews partly or wholly as their national home. Here are the main concept, concepts at work once more. Imperialism, anti-colonial nationalism, and anti-racism. There was no anti-Semitism at work here. None of the ideas that would lead to the Holocaust. They would find their home in the sewers of the Hindu right. The form of nationalism that did mimic European nationalism's narrowness and produced people like RSS leader M.S. Golwalkar, who wrote in 1939, around the time of the uh, Palestinian revolt of 36 to 39, he wrote how Hitler's Germany, rightly to his mind, was purging the country of Semitic races, the Jews. National pride at its highest has been manifest here. Germany has shown how well nigh impossible it is for races and cultures having differences going to the root to be assimilated into one united whole, a good lesson for us in Hindustan to learn and profit by. So Goldwalker is writing this just at the same time as the Congress is taking a diametrically opposed position. It's not like they didn't know what was happening. He well knew, was in fact responding, in my opinion, to what the nationalists were saying, which is that they were understanding the main lens for them was anti-imperialism, anti-racism, anti-colonialism. This, or the lesson that Golwarka le learned from European history and European nationalism, was not the lesson learned by the Indian National Congress, the Indian Socialists, and the Indian Communists. They did not accept the fascism of the Hindu right, nor of Germany's Nazis. They adopted a policy drawn from their anti-colonial nationalism, from their genuinely anti-fascist politics. It was one thing to take this position, but it was another to do something about it. India could give no tangible support to the Palestinians at this time. It did, however, conduct activities to build support within India for Palestine. The Congress declared that September 27, 1936 would be celebrated as Palestine Day. Nehru led mass rallies in support of Palestine. In Allahabad, his hometown, Nehru told a large crowd, our sympathies and good wishes must go to the people of Palestine in this hour of their distress. The crushing of their movement is a blow to our national struggle as well as to theirs. We hang together in this world struggle for freedom. We hang together in this world struggle for freedom. Once more, the brutality of the British response irked Nehru. The whole Arab world is aflame with indignation, and the East, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, has been deeply affected by this brutal attempt to crush a people struggling for their freedom. Palestine Day was observed again on August 26, 1938, with the Congress and the left fully behind the Palestinians and against the partition of their country. It was the most that the Indians could do. The British did not allow passage of supplies of any kind to Palestine. They created a wall against the solidarity that was clearly on display from the Indian nationalists toward the struggle of the Palestinians against colonial fascism. A decade after Nehru had made close contact with the Chinese nationalists in Brussels, Japan opened up a brutal war against China. This war revealed Japan's fascist ambitions, as the island nation used its full force against a largely disoriented Chinese resistance. Nehru was personally rattled by the war. Japan had been elevated to a position of great respect for its victory against the Russians in 1905 and for its advances in material wealth. But now, all that was gone. <coughs> Japan had reduced itself into the column not only of fascism, but also of imperialism. At the 1937 imperialist, Imperial Conference, see, those days they just did it straight away. 
They had things called the Imperial Conference. Now they call it the G7 meeting. And the ministerial meeting of XY. In those days, they were unabashed, you know. At the 1937 Imperial Conference, Australian Prime Minister Joseph Lyons suggested a non-aggression pact with Japan that would tolerate Japan's imperial ambitions in order to prevent war. Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain felt that this pact would be an enormous burden of Britain's shoulders. Britain looked to Japan to accept the pact, hoping it would carve up East Asia to benefit both empires. Japan, however, calculated that it would be, that it would be able to take all of East Asia and did not need to make a deal with the British and the other settler colonies. That the British were prepared to make such a deal showed their hand. It revealed the collusion between the various imperial forces, and it showed how they would eventually clash, as Lenin had argued in 1916 over markets and resources. Chamberlain had seen China as one of the great markets of the world, which was the main lens for the British gaze at China for over 100 years. It was also how Japan saw things. This was the imperialist consciousness. The Indian nationalists stood with the Chinese. The Congress took the view of complete opposition to Japanese aggression and sympathy for China. The Congress's foreign department, newly created under the wing of Nehru, produced an important pamphlet written by Ramanor Loya, who becomes a major socialist leader, entitled India on China, published in 1938. A China relief fund was set up, and China Day was observed in solidarity. On November 26, 1937, General Chu De, one of Mao's most revered generals, and by the way, one of the best books about the Chinese struggle of this period is Agnes Smedley's biography of Chu De. It's just a riveting read. You know, this American woman goes to Yenan, befriends Chu De, and then just follows him and writes his story. It's an incredibly good book. On November 26, 1937, General Chu De wrote to Nehru to thank India for its help and to ask for more help by any and all means. He asked for doctors. By May 1938, a medical team went to China, led by Dr. Madan Mohan Atal, along with Dr. Cholkar, Dr. Dwarkana Kotnis, Basu, and Dibesh Mukherjee. The team lived in Yenan, where Mao had built his base. They practiced through mobile clinics treating wounded Chinese soldiers and civilians. Dr. Kotnis became part of Mao's Eighth Root Army. He would eventually join the Communist Party, marry a Chinese woman, have a son, and then die very young in, 1930, in 1942. Mao said of Dr. Kotnis, the army has lost a helping hand. The nation has lost a friend. Let us always bear in mind his internationalist spirit. Tangible assistance was now possible through the ambulance service and the doctors, but even this was seen as insufficient. Nehru wanted to do more. He visited China from August uh, 23rd to September 5th, 1939. He went, as he put it, because China is the symbol of magnificent courage in the struggle for freedom, of a determination which has survived untold misery and unparalleled disaster of unity before a common foe. Nehru wanted to visit the Indian medical team, but he could not. Nor could he take advantage of Mao's invitation to visit Yenan. Now, I'm going to write a short story. I've started drafting it about the fantasy meeting of Nehru and Mao in Yenan. I mean, imagine if they had met in Yenan in 1939. Imagine Nehru was such an easily influenced person. <laughs> imagine what might have happened. <laughs> He did, however, get uh, very briefly to visit Dr. Dibesh Mukherjee in Chungking. Indian solidarity with China would continue through the war against Japan, with delegations moving between the countries to cement ties and to deepen relationships. It was less the historical ties between these two Asian powers that drew them together, and more their common ant antipathy towards imperialism and fascism. This is what united their internationalist nationalisms. In 1936, a left-wing coalition government won the elections in Spain. It came with a broad agenda to lift Spain out of monarchical depression into the modern era, where workers and peasants could govern their society. By the way, Spain, as you know, is continuing to try to get out of monarchical depression. Again, the monarch has decreed that 
the Catalan question cannot be raised. I mean, this is like a perpetual problem. It's a good reason not to have a king. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of the block is the monarchy. They have these fantasies. If you go to Spain, you must visit Franco's grave. Uh, don't go to all the Republican sites. Go and visit Franco's grave. Then you see fascism alive and well. You see how enormous the whole valley is basically given over to Fra a memorial for Franco. And there are celebrations where they give the, sing the fascist songs. Viva España. It's amazing. <laughs> The British writer, Arthur Bryant, returned from a visit to Spain and told his friend, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, what he feared. The revolution is beginning, Bryant said to Baldwin. On the walls he saw the symbols of the hammer and sickle, and in the streets, the undisguised signs of bitter class hatred fomented by unceasing agitation by Soviet agents among a poor and cruelly misled peasant and working class population. Baldwin's secretary to the cabinet, <coughs> Sir Maurice Hanke, worried as well. With France and Spain menaced by Bolshevism, he said, it is not inconceivable that before long it may pass us to throw in our lot with Germany and Italy. Let me read this again. This is a British cabinet secretary writing in 1936. With France and Spain menaced by Bolshevism, it is not inconceivable that before long it may pass us to throw in our lot with fascist Germany and Italy. There was only a thin line that divided British imperialism from German and Italian fascism. A line so thin that it was not apparent <laughs> to Brian, Baldwin and Hanke. It was clear to these men that fascism would be a bulwark against communism. They were willing, even eager, to join with the fascists in their own united front against communism. This was clear from Ethiopia, as I showed you, from Spain, from China even at the Imperial Conference of 1937, where the British felt that the communist peril had to be stopped at all costs. The fascist-backed forces of General Franco traveled across the Mediterranean Sea from Morocco to begin the Spanish Civil War, a brutal conflict that took many lives and devastated Spain. Franco was armed and assisted by the Germans and the Italians, as well as by Britain, which maintained an embargo of arms to the Republican forces that had been backed by the Soviet Union. See how similar this is? The British had an embargo against Ethiopia as well, and allowed the Italians to use Somaliland to bomb uh, thing. You know, it's the same story. Britain colluded with all these fascist adventures from Spain out to China. China less, but certainly Ethiopia. Nehru told the Congress session in December 1936, in Spain today, our battles are being fought, and we watch this struggle not merely with the sympathy of friendly outsiders, <coughs> but with the painful anxieties of those who are themselves involved in it. This idea of being insiders to the Spanish fight against fascism and imperialism was key. Our battles, said Nehru. Again, previously, in the context of China, he said, our struggle, our fight against the Japanese. This was not a distant fight. Like the struggles in Ethiopia, Palestine, and China, the battle in Spain was a front line in the anti-colonial struggle. No wonder, therefore, that the Indian nationalists did their best to assist the Spanish Republic. In 1937, Nehru wrote a pamphlet that was published by the Indian Committee for Food for Spain. He opens the pamphlet asking why Indians, who must deal with their own misery, should assist the Spanish. It was not for humanitarian reasons, Nehru wrote importantly. We seek it in order to throw our weight, such as it is, on the right side in a vital conflict which is of tremendous significance to us and the world. We seek it in order to disassociate ourselves publicly and through action from the policy of the British government which has lined itself with the fascist powers. We seek it in order to demonstrate to the world that we stand with the democratic and progressive forces in the world. Indian students in Britain working with the India League and the Communist Party of Great Britain held cultural evenings to raise funds for an ambulance to Spain. The ambulance would eventually get to Spain and help the Republicans. 
In India, a Spanish relief committee in Bombay worked to raise money while the Congress Socialist Party organized Spain days across the country. Volunteers from around the world joined the international brigades to defend Spain. It is well known <coughs> that fighters from the United States in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and Europe went and joined the international brigades. What is less well known is that fighters came from the anti-colonial struggles as well. Najati Sidki, for example, came from Jerusalem. In his autobiography, he recalls how the Spanish Republicans took him to the front so that he could, in Levantine Arabic, shout to the Moroccan soldiers who fought for Franco to decamp to the side of anti-colonialism. Problem is, the Moroccan soldiers would barely have understood his basically, you know, Levantine Arabic. Because it is really night and day in some ways. Anyway, he gave it a try and he yelled across the line. This is from his autobiography. Listen, brothers, I am an Arab like you, coming from a distant Arab country. I beseech you, brothers, to abandon the ranks of your generals who are oppressing you in your country. Because after all, they come from the Spanish protectorate of Morocco. It's hardly a protectorate, it's a colony. That was how they talked about things. Trusteeship, protectorate, etc., etc. I beseech you, brothers, to abandon the ranks of your generals. Come to our side where you will be well treated and given a daily allowance. Those of you who do not want to fight will be returned to his land and family. Viva el Front Popular, Viva la Republica, Viva Moroccanios, he said. And he writes in his autobiography, Moroccanios. <laughs> it's pretty, okay. <laughs> it's pretty charming little story. Of course, nobody crossed the line. <laughs> My guess is they didn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> Fighters came from Indonesia, from Vietnam, from Japan, and from China. In Yenan, the Chinese communists marched with a sign that read, Salutamos les pueblos bravísimo de la España, in their broken Spanish. There is actually a picture that I've seen of this, which I was trying to get, but I couldn't find it. It's a very grainy quality of the protest in Yenan, in defense of the Spanish Republic. They had enough things happening to them, by the way, in 1937, uh, to be worried, being bombed by the Japanese, or, but there they were, you know, standing with the Spanish Republicans. Um, several Indian doctors, including Dr. Madan Atal, who would later go to Yenan, came to serve the Republican cause. Atal was joined by Dr. Ayub Ahmed Khan and Dr. Manuel Rocha Pinto. Although Atal went to Spain as part of the Spanish Medical Aid Committee, a group developed by the British left rather than through the Indian nationalist effort directly. The writer Mukraj Anand was in England as a student when he found himself in the anti-fascist struggle. In the anti-fascist movement, he later wrote, Indians were accepted as equals for the first time in England. Mukraj Anand went to Spain in 1937 to participate in the Second International Writers Congress in defense of culture in Madrid. The halls were filled with anti-fascists, such as Pablo Neruda and George Orwell. Neruda mourned the murder of his friend, Federico Garcia Lorca, by the fascists in August of 1936. This war, Neruda later reflected, was between darkness and hope. Mukraj Anand joined the international brigades to fight the murderers of hope, as he put it. But Mukraj Anand was not ready to kill anyone. I fainted on seeing a wounded man bleeding in Dr. Bethune's surgery in Barcelona during the Spanish War, he recalled. This was the Canadian doctor, Norman Bethune, who arrived in Spain in November 1935 to give his medical experience to the cause. He would later become a communist and would spend most of his life in China with Mao's armies, in whose trenches he died in 1939. When Bethune left Spain, he wrote a poem whose last lines echoed from Gravehurst, Ontario, where Bethune was born, to Peshawar in British India, where Mukraj Anand was born. Comrades who fought for freedom and the future world, who died for us, we will remember you. Blood was not for Mukraj Anand. I asked to be put in the category of journalists, near the trenches, as I felt I couldn't shoot anyone, even an enemy. Mukraj Anand's essential dispatches, homage to Spain, appeared in Congress Socialist and elsewhere. He wrote with great passion about what he observed. He painted a picture of the death and the destruction, and then he wrote in one of his pieces. These pictures repeat themselves on the walls of Madrid, and they tell different tales of this war, 
tales of death inflicted from the air, tales of statues destroyed and books trampled upon, tales of blood which has dried on the floor of homes, different tales, but tales with the same moral, that fascism must be destroyed. Murkaj Anand could not fight in the war, Sorry. but Gopal Mukul Huddar certainly did. Huddar has an interesting trajectory. He was a founder of the fascistic Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS, in 1925 in his hometown of Nagpur. In England, as a student, Huddar began to slowly drift away from the RSS and from the fascistic tendencies of European nationalism. He was eager for the brisk wind of freedom. Spain called this young man, who joined the international brigades on October 17, 1937. By February 11th of the next year, Huddar was in Tarazona to train and then moved with the 15th International Brigade to defend Gandesa in Catalonia, outside Barcelona. It's a site to go and visit, actually. If you do a Civil War tour, you should visit Gandesa to see the front line of that battle. It's very nicely commemorated. Huddar's comrades faced the Italian fascists, led by Mario Berti, in a particularly vicious battle. Berti, who was the chief of staff of the Italian army, during the early part of World War II, would be exonerated later by the Allies for his role in the fascist war. It is a telling reminder of how many fascists were not prosecuted and how the Allies colluded with so many of them through Operation Paperclip, which brought the fascists to the United States and other rat lines, what they call a rat lines, to South America. You know, here was this Italian leading an Italian detachment against the international brigades in the middle of Spain. I mean, sounds a lot like Syria to me. But that's another story. Huddar was captured by Franco's forces and imprisoned in San Pedro de Cardena. In jail, Huddar, being a crafty fellow, read palms and played the fakir. He was released to the British and returned to India after spending some time in London where he was celebrated by the British and Indian left. When he descended from his ship in Bombay, Huddar was greeted by the Cong Congress Socialist Party. Remember, this is the guy who helped found the RSS. Such an interesting trajectory. It's stunning that, we, you know, that there's no monograph on his life, biography. At the dock, he said, the honor you have done me is really the honor to the cause of democracy and freedom, which Spanish workers and peasants are defending with their lives. The fight for democracy is in India, just as it is in Spain. The very same British imperialism, which helps Franco and Mussolini in their attempt to destroy Spain, is holding us down. We have to fight against it. We have to build the unity of the workers, peasants, and the middle classes, just as the Spanish people have done. Huddar, who had started life as a Hindu fascist, joined the Communist Party of India in 1940. In an article la written later in his life, Huddar argued that the Hindu fascists did not know the difference between Renaissance and revivalism. He wanted the Renaissance of Indian culture, the ability to breathe life into what had been stifled by British rule. The RSS wanted to revive a fantasy version of Indian culture that adopted its idea of culture from European nationalism and imperialism. In June 1938, Nehru visited the Republican enclave of Spain to offer Indian solidarity, um, to offer Indian solidarity for the fight against fascism. He met the Republican uh, generals whom he admired, including <coughs> General Lister, Lister uh, and Dolores Ibaruri, La Passionaria. She was, he wrote, the symbol of Spain's agony and Spain's unconquerable spirit. But Spain would soon be conquered. France would close its borders to appease Mussolini, and supplies would end to the Republic. Franco's army swept north, destroying the Republic. When Nehru traveled in the Republican regions, he said he saw light there, the light of courage and determination, and of doing something worthwhile. That light would go out in the eyes of the Spanish people. The behavior of England and France, Nehru noted, was the parent of Munich, a reference to the Munich conference where the British gave the Nazis Czechoslovakia. This Munich agreement essentially allowed Nazi Germany to take over continental Europe. Such was the collision between the various forms of imperialism. On July 19, 1936, La Passionaria gave a fine speech in Madrid where she said, no pasaran, they shall not pass. This was the slogan of not only the Spanish Republicans, but it became the slogan of anti-fascists everywhere. 
It appealed as well to anti-colonial struggles. On March 28, 1939, when Franco took Madrid, he said, hemos pasado, we have passed. It was the end of the Spanish Republic. As Nehru noted, the ambassador of Britain's government goes to pay tribute to Franco and to greet his parade of victory. That alliance seemed firm. It was against humanity. The year before, on January 30th, 1938, when the war still seemed to be undecided, the India League organized a large demonstration in London in solidarity with the Indian, Chinese, and Spanish people. 1,200 people marched down the streets of London carrying flags of the republics of Spain, Ireland, and of the Indian National Congress. Their resolution was expansive, seeing the fight against imperialism in India, Burma, Ceylon, in Africa, and the rest of the colonial empire as part of our common struggle for democracy and against fascism and war. It was this broad anti-colonial and anti-fascist spirit that drove the agenda of what would become the spirit of international nationalism. When the Spanish Republic fell, the German communist playwright Ernst Stoller hanged himself in a New York hotel room. Nehru, who knew Toller well, wrote a moving account of his friend's commitment and of his own. Nehru met Toller at the uh, League Against Imperialism meeting and had come to appreciate his sensitive soul and his political work. Toller was the president of the short-lived Bavarian Soviet Republic, it lasted six days in 1919. He had put his faith, Toller had put his faith in the Spanish Republic as a front line against fascism and colonialism. It was there that humanity fought. Um, against the barbaric hordes of fascism, Nehru wrote. Tola gave all his money to the Republican cause and worked for it ceaselessly. He was a Jew, Nehru wrote. Yet this Jew was such that later he wrote to me that he entirely agreed with what I had written in favor of the Arabs in Palestine. Justice was its touchstone, not identity alone. The world of fascism was too brutal for his sensitive spirit, too coarse of this fine nature, Nehru wrote. But it was democratic England and democratic France. This democratic, you know, Nehru wrote with a great deal of acid in his pen. But it was democratic England and democratic France with their false promises and betrayals and stabs in the back that broke him. Were these really false promises and betrayals? Nehru knew better than that. This was the curious nature of imperialism, to fear human possibility and to give courage to human hatred, to lean on violence against sanity to allow the Holocaust to happen and then to be surprised by it, to believe that colonialism can make its comeback after World War II when the evidence of atrocities came into the heart of Europe. Nehru ends, in, sorry, Nehru. Neruda ends his great poem for the loss of Spain, the loss in many ways of humanity with these powerful lines. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Thanks. So we have time for questions, and um, Dijin, are you comfortable? Yeah, please, just go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, it's a fun little side project I'm doing. <laughs> I'd love to have conversation around it. Please. No, I was thinking what would be nice, I'm going to make a little book about it with pictures of, because the pictures I think help the story here. Like there are pictures of, you know, Balaji Buddha, uh, when he's a young man with a, this hat, when he looks like Veer Savarkar, you know, and then he goes and becomes, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, because it is, uh, I mean, I studied Arabic literature and Arabic poetry, but it's There's a long, li big literature on the Indians in the British Empire service. So this goes back actually to the uprising in 1956, 57, 58. 
there was a major uprising. You know, the British government didn't control India until after this uprising. It was basically a private trading company, uh, which had its army. So this major uprising breaks out. Some of it revivalist, you know, restorative, restoring others, peasant uprisings, all kinds of things. Uh, the British could not bring sufficient troops to put the uprising down. So they leaned on some of their monarchal allies. And two crucial allies uh, are there to, you know, to be on the table as it were. One is the Maharaja of what you know, now is Nepal. And you see, a promise was made to them. I mean, if you, uh, Kathmandu has many casinos. And if you go to the Kathmandu casino and you, have you ever played Prakash, you know, yeah, okay. Come on, you gotta play with a blackjack or something once in a way. Anyway, you know they exist, okay? I'm not, okay, fine. I'm not a moral person, okay? I'm a, kind of a wretched person, actually. I'm not go with you. Yeah, okay. I'm not a really good person. Anyway, so, you know, if you win, somebody might say to you, that's a Lucknow loot. It's a phrase that gets thrown around, Lucknow loot. So that phrase comes from 1857, when the British basically told the Nepali Maharaja, send your boys over, crush these bloody peasants, and you can loot. And they looted. The second major ally was they turned to the Pulkia states. These were the Sikh rulers in the Dwaba region, and said, join us. And several of them did. So, the British, it's very interesting, after the, when the British colonial state is constructed, they recruit militarily from the Burkina states and from Nepal. That's the core of the British Indian Army. And then eventually they turn to the Madras sappers and, you know, other sections. But really the core is the, you know, Punjab and the eastern, uh, sorry, western Nepal, the Gurkha land area. And so that is a very old history. And you know those families uh, became entirely reliant on having children go and join the military. <coughs> so they were not joining the military ideologically. You know this just became so in Punjab from the great famines and the great agrarian collapse in the late 19th century onward, it became crucial to send a kid, a son, into the military. It was cash. It was like a remittance payment you know, coming from sending you abroad or something like that. So these places became captivated. So very interesting, when the nationalist movement starts, one of their core, especially during World War I, was to campaign against recruitment. The radicals campaigned in this, but it was very difficult. Because what do you offer people in exchange? Because, you know, entire life, so actually the Gurkha recruitment into the British Army ended in the last 30 years, you know, they started slowing it down and now it's basically ended. It was huge economic problem and I, I remember talking to somebody who said, well, you know, you can now understand the Maoist insurgency in Western, I don't think there's a correlation, but it's an interesting thought. So uh, there was an attempt to not have people be recruited, but how do you, you know, switch that? Now, Punjab is different from Nepal in this story. There's a divergence. Because in Punjab, the national movement takes root for all kinds of reasons. You know, agrarian collapse in sections of eastern uh, Eastern Punjab, the parts that are now in India, that's a big issue. All kinds of reasons the national movement takes root. Uh, in Nepal, it had a curious position anyway. You know, uh, ne Nepal had its own national movement. There was no thought. It's, it's a fascinating. Why wasn't the Nepali Congress? Part, because after all, the Pulkia states were also, you know, states of Hyderabad. Itself. There was never a thought that this was a part of the Indian nationalist movement. It was its own nationalist struggle. So the experience of nationalists in Nepal being able to uh, tackle the question of the Gurkha was very much constrained. Firstly, they were tackling their own problem, which is the king, not the British directly. So it was slightly different. Whereas the Punjab thing was, you know, it's also complicated. Because Punjab till now is a major recruiting ground for the military. That history continues. It's not that the Punjabis are more <coughs> military or anything. That was an idea that 
those who supported the British during the uprising became martial races. Those who didn't support them, like the Bengalis, were effeminized. That was the simple calculation of imperialist logic. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, this is, your talk was great because it did crystallize some things that were kind of throwing me for a loop when I was writing about anti-fascism in the United States, too, which is that, particularly when you looked, I mean, because when, when historians approach, it seems like many of historians approach the subject of you know fascism and colonialism, they'll try to make, they'll be really impatient with anybody who tries to conflate the two, right? They're, they're very distinct systems, right? But you know, from the lived experience of the left that was coming out of the 30s, 40s, even beyond, I think what you kind of crystallize is because of not only the, um, the collusion between imperial powers and fascist powers, but also the fact is, that you, as you said, the effects felt very similar of these two systems, that it, it seems somehow an academic distinction in the worst sense of the world or to, to try to distinguish these two things of fascism and colonialism kind of too rigidly, right? But, but that said, I'm mean, really found, um, so yeah, so there's that great quote from Cicero, right, you know, in Discoursing Colonialism, where he talks about, you know, um, Hitler is the demon in every kind of white Christian, or, yeah, or white Christian. I was tempted to put that yeah, on a yeah, slide, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to hold back. No, no, it's great. It's such a good line. No, it's, but it's a good line, right? Um, but that's the thing. And so I was wondering if you saw this in the archive. The closest thing I saw of activists making a distinction, right, um, on the left, uh, anti-fascist between colonialism and fascism was amongst African American anti-fascists. That there was this kind of line that kind of um, kept popping up from Robeson to Langston Hughes, even to right, Robert, Robert Williams after the war, the Panthers. That the closest thing you can make a distinction between those two things is that one relies on this kind of idea of liberal democracy, and it sets up this kind of world, this distinction between citizens with democratic rights and then kind of the racial abject others. Whereas what you know fascism does is it you know insert you know, it throws open the circle of rightlessness to everybody while tightening the screws down on the people who were formerly marginalized before, so they're even worse, right? Um, and you saw you see this like in Panther, but I'm wondering if you saw this in any that kind of line or that kind of distinction operating anywhere else in the in the archives that you were looking at. So it's a it's a very important uh, conversation, and it's it'll be impossible. To, this is a long conversation, but let me come at it from another archive, uh, which I'm very interested in, which will be inserted in here eventually. I didn't want to put it here because maybe it would get too much into communist history. You know, it's a different realm. Although this is where the African American experience is very instructive, because it was through the experience of African American communists that you'll get this anti-fascist uh, colony. Robin's essay is very good. This ain't Ethiopia, but it will do, you know, on Spain. Um, so uh, the, the other conversation that's taking place simultaneously is in the commentary. And, you know, in 1935, Dimitrov gives his very famous lecture in the commentary where he sets up, you know, what is uh, this fascism that we have to tackle. At the same time, Palmyro Togliati, who becomes the leader of the Italian communists, is teaching in the schools in Moscow about fascism. And his lectures on fascism are just going to be reprinted. And those are actually very good lectures there. I think 11 lectures he gives. But he goes into this thing about, he's interested in Italy. He's talking to the Italian comrades. And he's talking about how fascism is not Mussolini. Fascism is what's happening to social life. You know, it's fascinating how when Gramsci is discovered, everybody's like, wow, he's the outlier. All these people shared those ideas. It's not like Gramsci was this genius and then Tagliati, Dimitrov, these were art, Stalin, you know. They all shared, they all understood this, that you know, that you have to tackle the cultural question, that it is swept into culture. What I found interesting is Tagliati, because again, limited vision of the Italian experience, doesn't say what was the history of that culture. Like why not then link it to Ethiopia and the previous war in 18, 96 against Ethiopia, and Italian bombing of Libya in 1911, you know, somehow he is not able to make that leap that Italian culture has become saturated with racism, you know, disdain for uh, the North African, etc. Similarly, Dimitrov, 
it's an incredible assessment of fascism. You know, it's one of the best assessments of fascism. His lecture in 1935 to the Comintern, really clear and smart. But even he doesn't make that. And it's interesting that this is the Comintern, which 10 years before is obsessed with the colonial question. But some of this drops off, you know, and and so I find the the I, if you go to the idea of culture, you know why, why I'm I'm interested in these Spain Day, China Day, Palestine Day, Abyssinia Day, Ethiopia Day. See, these nationalists wanted to hold meetings to bring into the culture the fact that our fight is not parochial. You know that peasant leaders in Bihar were doing a rally where they were talking about Spain. You know they wanted to educate people that what we are fighting against that bloody district commissioner, that district commissioner is not a personality issue. That same district commissioner is sitting in a plane bombing the Ethiopians. This is a cultural struggle. You're trying to lift people's cultural imagination in the same way as the fascists are narrowing it. So I found that interesting that, you know, what is the difference between fascism and imperialism? You know, it's not like Cesar doesn't understand. As I said, you know, he knows the technical distinction. But there is something about the racism under both that links it together indelibly. And I think if the category racism disappears from the literature of fascism, you don't get the, it's the bridge between imperialism and fascism. You know, it's racism is the clue. That's why Cesar's discourse on colonies should be read by everybody. I mean, you know, I, in, in European history classes, it should be mandatory. It's a book about Europe. It's not a book about, you know, the Caribbean or Africa or, you know, or Vietnam. I mean, it, it's about Vietnam as well. Because he starts by saying, who is this person, Serrat? You know, I don't know if you remember, he goes after Serrat, you know, who is this gentleman? You know, this great distinguished man, he's this bastard in, Britain, in you know, Indochina who's doing. But this is not a book about Indochina, it's about Europe. And I think Cesar gets it, that the bridge between the two is racism. It's so foundational. I mean, how can you have a concept of fascism without underlying a racist society? Fascism cannot grow unless society is racist. It will find no tinder to burn. And that's what, that was the culture that these anti-colonial nationals tried to foster, an anti-fascist culture. You know, th that's the main thing. In, in America, for instance, I would say there has been less success in creating an anti-fascist culture. You know, because racism is so much part of the ethical standard, it's so allowed, that fascism is easy. You know, all these books, it can't happen here. I mean, why do you... There is nothing about racism in Sinclair Lewis's book. You know, I read the book recently like everybody. Where is racism, man? Lewis, you know, I mean, I know you're a radical, like granted. It's a great book, but it's a, you've got to read it. Actually, better than that is Philip Dick, Man in the High Castle, because he gets the racism. I mean, he's not a nice person, <laughs> but he gets the problem. So yeah, I mean, it's a long conversation. Actually, have this conversation, Chris. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a great conversation. I would like it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to dominate, but just Please. a comment. The Soviet Union brought it back to the UN and fascism, colonialism, and racism as reinforcing and establishing a, a evil that against which that the United Nations basically should be working. And as countries gain their independence, they also, the newly independent countries, as they join the UN, they kind of grab that. And through the 60s, it, it was uh, mostly in the human rights debates and so on would be uh, there as three elements. Uh, I mean, it's actually quite interesting what's happening in current events, which is why current events are so historical. The main UN agency was UNESCO. You know, Claude Levi-Strauss, for instance, left his high tower to write that terrific book for UNESCO again about racism. Mm -hmm. And of course, now Israel and the United States have left UNESCO, whose charge essentially is anti-racism, 
anti-fascism, anti-imperialist thinking. I mean, it's of all the UN agencies, it has what I thought always was the most unifying human charge against hierarchy. I mean, as a child, I used to read UNESCO Courier. It came free to our library. And it was a great magazine. It was filled with stories about people everywhere in the world. It helped exactly as you're saying. But of course, the United States is against humanity. So it has to leave UNESCO by its own judgment. It's incredible. Of all agencies to withdraw from, you withdraw from UNESCO. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, it's it's always interesting to me how this kind of gets lost, but a lot of like the techniques of fascism, like you were talking about, were developed in colonial situations, like uh, concentration camps, for example, um, were used in Namibia for like mass extermination in the late uh, 1800s, uh, and so. It's interesting to me because I think the difference from my perspective of like fascism and imperialism is that fascism is like necessarily like reactionary, whereas imperialism is you know, just kind of this thing that's always happening. I mean, fa fascism, you could argue, is always happening in some sense, and it's like just like degree and not kind. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess that's mostly my thought is like. When, when like these things develop, like like was Suharto a fascist? You know, like I, I think that's an interesting question. I don't think he was, but like yeah. So I, I guess I'm wondering more about like the right nationalist, um, the right nationalist like uh, uh, politics of like colonized countries, um, where it's like maintain power and like how you would classify that. Yeah, I mean, it's, look, just uh, one point before directly to your Suharto, the Pinochets, and so on. But yeah. one point just before that, um, <coughs> look, I think how I would see it or how I understand it is, of course, imperialism is a world system and it has to do with, you know, questions of markets, resources, monopolies, trying to dominate the world, etc. That's all true. But when in a colonial situation, when a colonial power is ruling, that the Valence of colonial power is fascistic. <coughs> so it's different from you know, imperialism, which is that global system of domination, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, driven by monopolies. But colonial power is virtually self-identical with fascism. You know, I mean, let's let's take a breath and look at India, which by you know British accounts now. They somehow want to suggest was treated was almost democratic, except you know they they were, they should have been a little more democratic, maybe. I mean the very fact that Shashi Tharoor needs to write a book to remind the British about imperialism is extraordinary. You know, I mean it's really extraordinary. And if you watch some of the debates he's been in the middle of, it's amazing that people actually are arguing against him. You know, I mean I I just had to resign from Third World Quarterly because the bloody editor put a piece in called the case for colonialism. I mean, what the hell is that? You know, this is a journal which is supposed to be. You know, it's like in feminist studies, you run a lead essay, the case for male supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Are you really going to do that? Is that really possible? Like, you, there's a hundred essays called the case for male supremacy, which are published every day. Does it have to be in this journal? I mean, this is our journal. That kind of that. You know, so and then people say it's censorship, which I found. Bizarre. There's nothing censorship about it. You publish the shit any way you want. Not here. <laughs> Not in my house. Okay. It's a private journal. Not in my house. You publish it in yours. That's okay. So, in the case of the British now saying, you know, the, well, if you look at the record of British rule, I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, now people are historians are now turning to prisons in India. They've been, you know. Last 20 years, a bunch of books have come out on incarceration. And you know, as incarceration becomes a theme in America, people in India start to write about incarceration. You know, they used to say, <laughs> if somebody sneezes in Paris, you get a cold in Calcutta. You know, so but actually, it's good that people are writing about incarceration in India. So one of the few times I find this epidemic useful, because the jails were brutal. You know, it's not like Nehru went to jail and just sort of sat around. And, you know, 
I mean, most of the nationalists were brutalized in jail. It wasn't like they were going and there was a guard and then, you know. I mean, you know, the British were nasty. That picture I have uh, of a jail, okay, uh, I mean, this is what jails look like, man, in the colonies. Somebody's got his head in the class, but the guy is, you know, mechanically turning it. What the hell is that? This was actually a device used in prisons. This is not some jailer's cocked up thing for that prison. This was a patented device. You know, you see this kind of stuff and you realize <coughs> that colonial power is fascistic because you have complete domination over a people which is racialized. You can do anything. Look at the Congo, where one man had dominion over a people. You know, over a decade, six to 10 million people died under the hands of Leopold's colonial rule. You know, despite the fact that an establishment journalist, Adam Hochschild, writes a popular book on it, there is virtual amnesia, you know, about that. I mean, why is it what happened in the Congo up there with the Holocaust? You know, today when you look at the Congo, its history, the, you know, the legacy of that, why don't we connect these things? It's a failure of our institutions. But just coming to your last point about right nationalism, See, I don't know really because I would like to see more empirical work on Pinochet. I'd like to see much more empirical work on Indonesia. <coughs> you know, Suharto's period, the New Order period, is very poorly written about. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of stuff about Sukarno because it's exciting and it's interesting. You know, who wants to spend their career reading police files about what the fascists do in Indonesia or in whatever? In Chile, you know, this is one of the problems with truth and reconciliation. It's actually reconciliation, not truth. That's actually what happens. Look at South Africa. I mean, where's the truth? To try to read some of these truth and reconciliation things, it's mainly reconciliation. They don't want to talk about everything. You don't want to name names. You don't want to suggest the depth of complicity. You know, so in Chile, how much do we know about Pinochet? We know the early years, Victor Hara's hands were cut off. We know about the early period, throwing out, helicoptering of left-wing activists, etc. Even politicians today, such as a prime minister, a president of Chile, whose father, <coughs> family was brutalized, they don't talk about it in public much. So we need to build an empirical, and I don't know about the distinction between right nationalist and fascist. You know, I think these are fascist powers. The technology of rule is definitely fascist. In Indonesia, they killed a million communists in what, like 10, 15 days? You know, the Australian Secret Service, the CIA, were faxing names to the Indonesian military of people to kill. There's that terrific book on Bali, Dark Side of Paradise. I mean, they were literally faxing names of people, the CIA. You know, million people slaughtered in 1965. And, you know, we are talking about oh, the crimes of Stalin. I mean, hello guys, what about this? Who's denying that? What about this? So, I think that technologies were quite fascist. But we need empirical research. Right up. Go and research Chile. That's the place. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned in terms of truth and reconciliation or kind of an emphasis on reconciliation. Because what really strikes me are the numerous strategic amnesias with regard to the story that you presented. Um, and there is certainly a kind of a break. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a, like a racial break, but it seems like there's a memory break or you know, some type of justice break with the, in the post-war period. And what I'm talking about here is like that you mentioned repeatedly that justice was the touchstone, right? And there's something like to move away from justice as a touchstone vis-a-vis -vis Palestine in 1948 is quite dramatic. And I'm wondering if that is in part attributable to the <coughs> emergent regime of human rights, which relies on universality and is predicated on reconciliation. I'm just curious if you see that break occurring maybe in 1948. See, in, uh, it's so, the Palestine story is very interesting because the 
I mean, it, it made no impact to these anti-colonial nationalists. All of them support, supported the Palestinians right until Oslo. You know, their unity with the Palestinian freedom struggle was not <coughs> broken. In fact, uh, the 1960 UN resolution on the right of, uh, to resist colonialism, you know, came in 1960. Uh, the, if you look at the discussion, that's a, it's my favorite UN resolution because it has my favorite line. That somebody could slip this poetic line into a UN resolution is incredible. They write, the process of liberation is irresistible. <laughs> I love that line. That's in a UN resolution. You know, I mean, it's like poetry. So the discussion of that, they don't call it Palestine, but they talk about the problem of the Arabs and the Jews comes up in that. And you see, what that resolution says is that armed struggle is fine. <coughs> That's a resolution that actually says that it's acceptable to use armed struggle to fight for your national liberation. That's an incredible resolution. Because in the frame of that resolution are the colonial wars <laughs> happening in Africa and in Southeast Asia. I mean, we've forgotten historically the war in Malaysia. You know, the great so-called emergency in Malaya, where the British you know, slaughtered I don't know how many Malays. Nobody's written a book like Carolyn Elkin's book on Kenya. That's a great book. I really recommend, if you're interested in that period, Caroline Elkin's, Harvard University, her book on Kenya is incredible, on the you know, so-called Mau Mau insurgency. She uses the archival material, and she just talks about those concentration camps, the mass killings of people. It's a really difficult book to read. And you know, she's a Harvard University prof. It's amazing. A great book. So somebody has to write that book on the Malay insurgency. Uh, there was two volume work came out some years ago from Cambridge University Press, but it didn't have that kind of detail. So what I'm just trying to say is that the idea that it's acceptable to fight against colonialism was such an important value in the majority of the members of the UN until really the 1990s. <coughs> I mean, what kills this idea, and this is why Israel suddenly earns a lot of friends, including India, what kills this idea is the death of the exhaustion of the anti-colonial ethic. You know, it is exhausted now. Uh, you cannot get any of these countries very few of them. You know, we, I went to the UN in Geneva. They had a 50th anniversary of the creation of the non-aligned movement. You know, I thought it would be packed with all the ambassadors. But you know who was there? The Iranians, Venezuelans. <laughs> North Koreans didn't come. But you know, Chinese were there. <laughs> you know, the Indians, they sent people, but not the you know, permanent representative. I mean, it's gone. It's exhausted. They all, during the 1990s, were told by the Americans. I mean, I got this directly from an Indian diplomat. He told me that he, the Americans told the Indians in the early 90s that the road to Washington, D.C. goes through Tel Aviv. You make uh, peace with Israel, then we'll talk to you. We'll get you the IMF deal. Every He said they were quite direct. India opens formal relations with Israel in 1992. In July 1991, <coughs> India gets the IMF deal. It's all package deal. You give up your non-alignment, give up your anti-colonial thing, surrender all your dignity, we'll give you the IMF deal. India had to actually fly tons of gold in July of 1991 to, to England to put into the Bank of England as a surety for that loan. A fact which should bring Indian nationalists to tears. But of course it doesn't, because they think it's economics. You know, this is humiliation. A category which has disappeared from social science should come back. This is pure humiliation. <laughs> pure humiliation. Can you imagine that India in 1991 has to actually, the, in, the banks would not take India's word for it. They actually had to fly the gold to London. I mean, 
It's incredible. Why was that not the front page in the newspaper, you know, like the Hindu and the front page, India flies gold to England. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, thank you for a very good talk. I was uh, uh, taken with your metaphor that racism is the glue between imperialism and fascism. I'm wondering um, what about another is in capitalism? Capitalism, another glue? Is that tape? Is, is it, it tape? Is, is it, it something <laughs> else that holds it together, but not glue? Somehow less central? Um, I mean, because you can imagine this would be a more like standard Marxist explanation. Uh, colonialism is the face of capitalism in the periphery, and that fascism is what happens in or when the social revolution is threatening to occur or has failed somehow. Right? And, and those are you know, those are some familiar narratives. We don't need to pin names to those. But how would you uh, react to that? Yeah, so now? it's like the thing I said earlier, which is that if I imagine that imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, is you know what unites in terms of, um, you see, it is, the it is the structuring force in the world order. That is to say, imperialism was a structuring force, which you know was rooted in monopolies, basically capitalist, uh, you know, social relations, and so on. But and this, I, you you guys have helped me clarify this. What I'm talking about are two forms of political power: fascism and colonialism. These are really forms of political power. I'm thinking. Underneath them is this political economy that is largely stable with its ups and downs. You know, so that when fascism ends in Europe, technically, or when colonialism ends, the bedrock remains the same. New forms of political power emerge. Then in, uh, through the vast and important anti-colonial movement, you have this 60, 70 year period of respite for the colonies. You know, they become independent states, they start religious economic policies, they make a go at something. But by the late 80s, 90s, debt crisis, etc., all that is shut down. So now we return to different forms of political power, which are perhaps the fascisms of the periphery. I mean, you know, uh, Duterte, uh, Modi, Erdogan. I mean, let's not be too shy about it, but uh, what about the very dear leader from Rwanda, you know, who wins with 90%, you know, he, you know, he's the beneficiary <coughs> of a certain kind of industry. And, you know, put, you know, let's go around the planet. We're going to see a new kind of peripheral fascism that develops in, in the realm of political power. But underneath that is this very volatile and you know, uh, very dangerous, turbulent imperialist system, which cannot create stability because it's crisis ridden. But on the surface emerges these forms of political power. And in this period, see what I'm actually, why I was interested in putting the story together was the immediate amnesia after World War II. Like after World War II, it was easy to say, well, fascism has been defeated. Now let's go ahead and recolonize Vietnam. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Vietnam War, or the Ameri French War on Vietnam, American War on Vietnam, was the complete you know, attempt at saying that colonial power is benign, whereas fascism is bad. You know, that's how I begin. And that's actually what motivates me, but this is actually deeper and more interesting. So let me think about this one. Sorry, I'm thinking aloud, so yes, sir. Okay, and just, so Jerry, okay. this will be our last question. Okay, so sorry, have, yeah. Oh, no problem. Yeah, so yeah, Jerry, you'll take us home. Yeah. As mm -hmm. okay. I just wanted to ask you about, first of all, I really appreciate your take on I think very clear and lucid and uh, helpful thinking about overlaps and you know, distinctions that are, are necessary to, to understanding kind of complex issues. 
but I, I want to ask you about fascism or the potential for it in the United States. Um, because I think an argument could be made along the basis that you've made today that you know we're looking at the the, uh, the current model of fascism that's represented by Trump and the alt right mm -hmm. and, and 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 some familiar language about the evils of cosmopolitanism versus nations nationalism and so forth. But I, I'm I'm wondering that one trajectory that or one one stream that that's been entirely missed is the Iraq War. Over a million Iraqis were killed by this country. And that has barely registered in American political culture, Amer American moral culture. The significant moral damage that that has done to the citizenry, that, that, they, can, they, that they could be part of that in the sense of which their government can, can destroy a country. Mm -hmm. And yet it has no moral significance in, in I'm, I'm, what I'm getting at, that, that kind of coarsening of the moral spirit, that also creates the ground for fascism. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Because I think, you know, for example, we could look at the Vietnam War, and in some ways, you could say that the anti-war movement saved this country from fascism. Mm. It saved this country from going down a disastrous path. I mean, they, they were talking at one point about using nuclear weapons in Vietnam, and it was only the anti-war movement that made that, and the resistance of the Vietnamese people that made that impossible. But there was nothing to stop them in Iraq. And, and, and I worry about that, because I think the American citizenry has been corrupted to the point where another Iraq c could occur tomorrow in Iran, and what would stop them? So uh, uh, you and I see the world in the exact same way, which is scary. <laughs> because yeah, that means that there are at least two of us. <laughs> uh, all right, we're not alone. We're not, we're not insane. So, all those things that I say to myself when I'm sitting alone on the treadmill, uh, <laughs> they're not the rant things of, you know, I scare people on either side. Actually, I just want them to move away a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, um, you see, this is exactly the point about society. Uh, there's an Indian, very important Indian uh, political figure who, in fact, was one of the drafters of the Constitution, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, who, in the 1950s, just before he died, began to write a book called India and Communism. And you know, we just published the bits of the manuscript that were left behind. But the book was never finished. The basic argument in the book is one with which I'm in complete sympathy. He argues that as long as India Indian society is caste-driven. You cannot have a communist revolution. That breaking social hierarchy is a necessary precondition for an egalitarian society. I mean, you're right about the anti-war movement saving America, but American society is saturated with hierarchy. I mean, the racists are only the more vulgar demonstration point of, I think, what is quite generally shared socially. I mean, let's forget about Iraq for a minute. I find it hard to forget about Iraq, but let's forget about it. This weekend, there was a massive bomb in Somalia. In the end, I think maybe 500 people will be dead. There are lots of hundreds of people ailing, trying to fight for their life. <coughs> now, I'm, tomorrow I'm uh, publishing an essay, which will, the theme is basically the International Division of Humanity, is the theme, not International Division of Labor, but of Humanity. And the basic point about the Somalia thing, because it's bothering me a lot, I don't think that an American, let's say, it's a very poor term to use, but an American sees themselves in a Somali. The Somali is an alien to them. It's a different species being to them. They may even believe that the Somalis have a different understanding of life. They cherish their children, Somalis don't. There are so many of them after all. This species being is not seen as united. So I don't think it's about lack of information. I think it's a much more fundamental philosophical problem that people just don't see themselves in other people. That's what you meant by the costing of the spirit, I think. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. That they're not seeing the thing. So let's take the example again of Again, of Somali, 
You know, you ask people, have you seen Black Hawk Down? It's an interesting film because it's about Somali. But people may not know it's about Somali. Because they think it's about Black Hawk and that group of people. If you, I mean, I watched it again, just to be sure. There's nothing about Somalia there. Somalia is like the backdrop in a video game. You know, you're in a Middle Eastern city, and you are got your gun ready, bang, bang. You know, these games that are there. It's just a backdrop. Some woman walks in a hijab. You, you can't, if you kill her, you lose points. She may take a gun out. You don't know. We don't know where we are in these movies. Zero Dark Thirty, this, that, and the other. But culturally, there is no attempt to provide people with the apparatus to understand that actually Somalia is not so far away. And I, just, I don't mean in the universal humanities term. I mean, how did Somalia, a state of great promise after British colonialism ended, how did Somalia get here? Shouldn't that be the question that somebody asks? You know, what is it that produced Al-Shabaab? How is it that as the great singer Kenan said after the piracy thing, he said, you ruin our fishing. You trawl a fish on our coast. Obviously, we become pirates. We have no livelihood otherwise. You know, these are basic questions. If you have a shared humanity, you would ask the basic question. How is it that this happened? Why did this happen? Curiosity only follows humanity. You are not curious about people who you don't share. You know, I, but I, what I mean by curiosity isn't like, oh, I'm curious about this flower. I mean the curiosity of how is it that human beings are in this turmoil? You know, what is going on? I mean, that is just absent. So in that sense, and you know, you'll know more about American fascism. I, I, I don't even want to read some of the stuff that's available, because it's like torment, you know. But I know that this society is, has always been prepared for it. And you know, this goes back, and I, I gave you Ambedkar's thing, but you know, Marx had a line in Capital, which is really quite an excellent line, and should be broadcast more. He said that the labor in white skin will never be liberated unless the labor in black skin is free. That's a line from Capital Volume 1. It's a great line. He's basically saying the same thing as Ambedkar. So if you don't tackle the social question of hierarchy, how can you be, how can you presume to have a hum human society? Like, I actually accept the view that we don't, we don't have humanity. There is nothing called humanity that exists. There is nothing called humanitarian. Human beings don't exist. Human beings can only exist when those divides end. I mean, the fact that something like that can be produced 100 years ago demonstrates that we have no humanity. You know, what do we care about? I mean, have you visited the Civil Rights Museum in DC? Nobody has, it's the first, I'm sorry, the African American Museum. Yeah. The line is, you have to book. I'm dying to go and see how the brutality is depicted. Because you know, it's one thing to depict struggle, because struggle is redeeming. But uh, struggle is only redeeming, by the way, for the oppressed. Struggle does not redeem the oppressor. The oppressor has to be redeemed by facing up to the brutality. You know, so I would like to have school children go through the museum of brutality. I'd like to have them see these devices. I'd like white school children to walk through the prison cells of slavery and experience brutality, not civil rights struggle. Because that's how you give your society an alibi. You hide behind Martin Luther King, and you say, we are now redeemed. Martin Luther King redeems non-white, mainly black children. He does not redeem white children. They need to see the bullwhip. That's what they have to confront. And I don't think that's happening at all. I think it's the opposite. We are hiding, allowing King to give everybody a free pass and saying we're beyond it. But this society is not beyond it. And nor is Indian society. You know, caste violence, I mean, that's why I, I suggest to you, there is no right nationalism. Right nationalism smells like fascism to me. To quote Kurt Cobain. <laughs> <laughs>